pH 41009 and pH 52005. Okay, so it's a three credit course. Uh, so one important thing is that on Mondays from 10 to 11, ideally suppose they are, it's supposed to run on Mondays and Wednesdays. Mondays from Monday from 10 to 11 and Wednesdays from uh, 8 to 10. But because I'm teaching this lab uh, for the, the first year students, things called DIY lab or something. So because I'm teaching that lab, um, it's it usually it runs on every Monday 9 to 12. So officially, I cannot teach you people at that same time. So I have taken the other slot from C flow C4. So this uh, slot on Thursdays at 10 to 11 a.m. So I'm planning to use this particular slot uh, for the uh, for order and chaos. So an important point is that the course will not run on Mondays, but it will run on Thursdays. So would that be fine with everyone? Yes, sir. OK. OK, so if you have any issues, let me know by email. But I hope uh, because I don't expect uh, the C4 slot only to be taken. So if uh, so, the main purpose of me calling this meeting also today, even though many people haven't registered, is that I wanted to make sure that I get this Thursday slot before somebody else picks it up. So in the future, if you are taking some particular elective or some other course, and if some professor is asking for the C4 slot, so please do fight for it and say that order and kiosk has already uh, planned courses on, on those on those slots actually. OK, so so right now I'll fix this because I don't see any uh, any kind of uh, issue for the moment, or at least you people haven't raised any issue. Um, so. So yeah, so that is it. So we have three hours per week. <clears throat> yes, does anyone want to say something? Yes, sir. I was confirming that the slot is Thursday 10 to 11. I think so. So C4 slot is on Thursdays 10 to 11, I think. You can oh, check oh. Uh, timetable, uh, Kharagpur. You just put timetable IT Kharagpur and you see. Uh... OK, let me also check from my side. Um, yeah, one second. Oh. So C4 slot, uh, it's from 10 to 11. Yeah, C4, uh, the fourth slot. Yeah. So, so yeah, so that, uh, so that is good. Okay. So with that, I'll just go into some basic introduction on why people study order and chaos uh, uh, in different systems. And I'll let you go today because uh, as I said, like people are just joining the course and I don't want to start making it heavy. Maybe I'll record this also because usually I record my classes so that People can watch it again or they can. Oh, somebody has already started recording. Okay, very good. So who has started recording? Hello. Sir, probably on Irvana started recording. Okay, good, good. So yeah, like you can always uh, tell it out. I'm not going to kill you or something. So okay, Anirban, just uh, make sure you stay till the end so that uh, it doesn't get cut off. Okay. Good, good. Uh, so uh, why do we study order and chaos kind of systems? So you are all familiar with. Uh, oh, sorry. Maybe I should like not use this. I guess you are all familiar with uh, the concept of chaos, at least from popular movies or from uh, from earlier courses or let's say even statistical mechanics, right? So I was teaching a statistical mechanics, and you have this uh, the probabilistic distribution of different systems, right? So where does this probabilistic dis uh, description come in, in the first place? Right? We always claim that everything is, uh, you have a distribution of uh, energies, you have distribution of, let's say if you have a, a particle in a, uh, in a, in a uh, gas, uh, a particle in a room which is like moving in a, in a uh, under the effect of thermal uh, fluctuations, sorry? Uh, sir, what books to follow, sir? Oh, you okay? So I'll most likely follow just Strogatz. Uh, so I have uh, Strogatz that I follow. Uh, so I'll I'll let you know that in tomorrow's sorry, in tomorrow's class, there are one or two more books actually um, that I can refer you people to. But if uh, we'll most likely follow just Strogatz. 
it's a very standard book uh, you can find it online uh, okay i should not be saying this but you can just go to uh, what is this website called again i forgot is it libgen yeah libgen libgen Lib yeah yeah so just go to libgen you type ashtogats and i think you should get it actually now if you're one of those people who likes to buy books uh, i personally never buy books uh, until i started teaching so if you're one of those people who buys books you can always uh, get the indian version indian edition so i think it's about uh, uh, i think it's around 1000 rupees less than 1000 rupees so it should not be with that expensive and uh, so gats it's a uh, Steven Stogas, I think, is a professor at uh, Cornell, if I'm not mistaken. That is one of the American universities, and uh, he is like quite famous uh, for introducing uh, uh, the uh, dynamical systems approach to very different systems, right? From biological, uh, economics, uh, physics, uh, chemistry, and all kinds of different systems. So it's a very co comprehensive book, and it has a lot of examples from different fields. So I think it's the it's it's one of the best books out there in the market so you can always you'll always take uh, so i think i'll follow that book so anyway i'll i'll we will discuss that next class right so I, when i start using my ipad i'll maybe write it out okay would that be fine yes sir yes sir yes. okay so maybe i can give you two more references but I, pass, I will just basically follow Stogatz. But if for people who are interested in uh, reading more, I can give you some more references. Okay, okay. So where was I? So I was just saying that uh, for a particle in a, in a gas, let's say, and if it's in thermal equilibrium, you kind of expect that the velocity of the particle is not to be a constant, right? I mean, you have a rough estimate from equipartition theorem, but uh, on an average, you expect some kind of fluctuations and stuff. And uh, where does this, where do these uh, inherent, uh, let's say, not inherent, where does this randomness come into the picture? So, uh, so there uh, you go into the picture of chaos, right? So if you have a system, you have a system with a lot of degrees of freedom, it's known that uh, the system can become chaotic. And so basically, if you have a, like very small degrees of freedom, let's say a particle, a single particle, a point particle, moving on in some magnetic field or electric field, you can officially track it uh, exactly uh, and then like the, trace out the trajectories and stuff, right? So un un unless you want to look at quantum mechanical effects, where again, a probabilistic description is necessary due to the um, uncertainty uh, and uh, other uh, issues at quantum uh, level. So there again, you have to go into a probabilistic distribution, uh, probabilistic description. But uh, in general, if you consider classical particles, you expect uh, a point particle to be, uh, you can exactly follow the trajectory of a point particle. But here, for, for example, in this video, we take an example of a, of a double pendulum. So basically you have a, a pendulum. So usually the pendulum, I mean, you have seen pendulums where the, the point of uh, the hinge is on the top, but here the hinge is uh, on uh, the middle of one of the pendulums. But uh, nevertheless, you see that there are the, uh, I mean, you can write down the equations of uh, motion, but uh, you, you can write down the equations of motion and you'd see that it, there are four degrees of freedom, meaning that you have one angle which describes this, uh, this black pendulum. It maybe it looks more like a guitar, I guess. I don't know. So you can, so uh, one angle for this black one, one angle for this red one, and th the velocity, the angular velocity, so that's theta dot for this one and theta dot for the red one. So uh, you have four uh, degrees of freedom, and the question is, uh, what happens uh, as you let the system evolve? So here, so this video is from Wikipedia, so you can just go and get uh, the references if you want. So here's a person who is trying to uh, start the pendulum from almost exactly the same position, right? So now the question is, can we uh, understand the dynamics? So let's just see the experiment as it evolves. So it's a, I guess it's a slow motion uh, video. So you see that all the six uh, versions, they are following the same exact trajectory, right? And uh, because they started from the same position, you expect some kind of uh, similarity, or at least you can expect that they all remain the same, at least for initial uh, amount of time. 
but soon you see that uh, some of them starts to deviate. Okay, and uh, some of some of the pendulums, I think they might be totally off, in the sense that uh, they uh, two, like, or maybe two of them are going along the same trajectory, but many others have already gone uh, beyond uh, similar trajectories. And now, for example, uh, you do not see that any, I mean, any two uh, versions are not correlated at all. So they are just going on their random paths. Right, so, so have you people actually uh, used or uh, uh, studied the double pendulum before? In classical mechanics, we, we, have, obtained the we, have, we have obtained the Lagrangian, but never tried to solve it. Okay, okay, good, good. So in today, in so in this course, uh, uh, like last time, I did not give a lot of computer assignments. So maybe this time is a good idea to check out uh, to uh, look at some computer assignments where you can actually go ahead and solve it yourself and convince that this is actually the case. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So basically, uh, you would have seen the double pendulum definitely at class in classical mechanics, and you would have studied the uh, the uh, the Lagrangian, the conserved uh, quantities and stuff, but uh, the trajectories or uh, the solutions to the equation is something that you might have not exactly seen. So uh, it's usually because uh, in uh, classical mechanics or in other courses, you basically deal with examples where you can actually solve the problem, right? In a class, so you can just write down the solution. So these are mathematically uh, tractable problems and stuff. So that is where usually uh, people uh, focus their efforts on. And uh, the solutions for this uh, double pendulum is not simple. So you basically have to solve it numerically. OK, there are some mathematical methods called as bounds. Which can uh, tell you exactly where the solution lies in the phase space, but it does not give you the exact trajectory. OK, OK, so now the system because the dissipative system because the pendulum moves in uh, in air, you have dissipation effects, which is finally killing down the motion. But initially, as you could see, there was uh, quite a difference in the trajectory. So can somebody tell me why? what is the uh, reason for this difference? Sir, there is a popular movie dialogue. Sir. Can... Yes, please go ahead. Introduce a little anarchy. Upset the established order and everything becomes chaos. Yeah, so uh, I mean, in a, put in a different way, I mean, you are basically correct. Put in a different way, uh, you have a high sense, a strong sensitivity to the initial condition. Okay, so okay, how do I restart this? So the person who is starting, right? So they are trying to start it at uh, the same position, but uh, the exact angle is not exact. The, the angle is not exactly the same, right? Because in any experiment, you cannot exactly restart at the same angle uh, to infinite precision, right? We all have uh, some kind of working precision for each instrument, so you cannot start with uh, infinite precision in such a, in such a setup. Even if you put all kinds of vernier calipers and so on, the even every <coughs> all uh, vernier calipers only have precision up to certain digits, let's say. Okay. So the question then comes is as to how uh, can um, uh, so how can we start as close as possible? So this is what this person has tried, right? Like almost the same angle is what we can see, but still, if you actually go and uh, measure it with a very highly precise instrument, you would see that <clears throat> the uh, angle is not the same, and this is the reason why you start to get uh, the uh, differences in the motion of the uh, pendulum. OK, this small difference between these, uh, these let's say, these two uh, systems would get amplified. OK, and it's amplified in an exponential fashion, uh, meaning that the amplification grows exponentially in time. And this growth of this, uh, uh, this difference is what makes you to see it in a finite amount of time, right? So even if the uh, difference is of the order of, let's say, epsilon, so this epsilon goes, uh, so this difference goes exponentially in time. So it's something which is like e to the power t of it. E, per, e to the power lambda t, where lambda is some Lyapunov exponent and so on, but it goes, the epsilon goes exponentially in time. 
Okay, so let's say it's epsilon naught at t equal to zero. So you might multiply epsilon naught by e to the power lambda t. And let's say if lambda lambdas of the order one uh, for t of the order of few seconds already, you see that uh, it's a very large number. Okay, it, it starts to go grow in orders of magnitude. So that is that uh, explains why you start seeing this uh, huge difference between the trajectories of motion in a finite amount of time. Okay. So I guess this is clear now. So if you have any questions, please do stop me. Uh, so this is uh, a system, a classical system that exhibits chaos. And uh, so the question is, how, why do we study such systems, right? So you see there's like a lot of sensitivity, sensitivity to initial condition and a very complex motion uh, that you see uh, in these systems. So, uh, such chaotic motion is something that you observe uh, in many places. So maybe let me start with uh, <clears throat> let me start with the top left corner. So uh, as soon as you see such signals, uh, you you start to uh, I mean if you follow a financial markets or something, you would uh, you would know that such kind of signals are uh, in a sense very chaotic. Meaning you cannot try to I mean it doesn't you don't see any kind of correlation between. Uh, the uh, the motion, let's say, uh, on few days with, uh, with respect to the motion in some other days, right? This is because it's influenced by so many factors. Uh, I mean, financial markets are driven by so many factors, like how what affects the population, what is the mood of the population. Like, let's say, if, if let's say some certain country wins the Euro Cup, they suddenly expect a spike in uh, in the market movement, right? So, so. So you have all kinds of bizarre uh, correlations between what happens in real life and the financial markets. So uh, understanding the uh, motion of or the trajectory of such markets, it's actually a very chaotic. Uh, in a, it's actually a very chaotic system. And understanding is like very complicated, right? So uh, such kind of uh, models or the study of order and chaos, let's say, or dynamical systems, is very much used in. Uh, in economics and the people who study economics from a, from a mathematical perspective also. Okay. And uh, so just below that, you see uh, what is known as this, uh, um, uh, this uh, oceanic circulation. So you have a, a, a stream of uh, current that goes around the ocean. So here you see the North American uh, belt actually. So this uh, stream of uh, oceanic current takes uh, Hot fluid from the uh, equator, and it transports it all the way to the uh, 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 in the yeah. slides. Oh, you can't see the slide. Okay. Can you? Okay, maybe I should. I'll, I'll not make it full screen. Just give me a second. Uh, now I can see sir. First slide. Yeah, good, good. So just give me a second. There's some. OK, OK, so uh, just somebody just knocked at you. OK, so you can see the slides, right? So let me try to make it full screen and let me know if you can still see it. So can you still see the slide? Yes, sir. OK, good, good. So maybe there's a problem changing the slide. OK, so I, what I was saying is this top left corner. So you see this Dow Jones, Nasdaq. I don't even know. I think Nikkei is like in Japan, I think. But others, I have no idea where they are. So uh, you, these are just financial markets, and I don't know what the signal talks about. But I just found it in some um, some like finance journal studying some chaos stuff. So or maybe some website which talks about chaos and stuff. So these are just images I just took from internet, so from some journal articles and stuff. Okay. So uh, yeah, you can Google them and find out exactly where it comes from. So the top one is just about some signal of. Uh, some market fluctuation that you see, and uh, typically such signals are very chaotic. As I was saying, you have a lot of uh, influence. Any like anything that happens on the real world influences these markets, 
and uh, this is like the, the definition of this you have of the sensitivity right so it's like so sensitive to certain aspects that you have like strong fluctuations and uh, any the behavior at some time might be totally different from the behavior at next time right so for example financial markets in 2018 are totally different from the financial markets in 2020 right so and just the uh, the oscillations of the market uh, trajectory one day might be totally different from the trajectory in another, at some other time so these are like uh, signals which are typical of a very chaotic system and if you look at uh, this double pendulum and i will we will do some simple assignments where i'll ask you to uh, solve some simple chaotic systems you will end up seeing uh, similar kind of trajectories okay so on the bottom left i was talking about this <coughs> great oceanic circulation so this is a simulation which was carried out at mit um, on uh, uh, some uh, model of ocean which they are trying to uh, develop and uh, here you see this big uh, stream of vortices that is like going across uh, the uh, uh, the eastern coast of uh, north america right so this stream of vortices uh, is being driven by what is known as uh, this oceanic circulation uh, uh, and uh, this uh, circulation uh, is basically a, a jet that is underneath the ocean that drives uh, fluid from the equator like hot fluid from the equator and it takes it all the way to the arctic and then it cools it down and then comes back right so you have this whole uh, uh, churning process that is happening on earth which is responsible for all kinds of climatic uh, uh, all kinds of changes in weather uh, all kinds of heating up of certain uh, parts of the uh, uh, alt at altitudes is it uh, it so for example it explains also why europe is slightly warmer than uh, uh, places in 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 america at the same altitude and stuff so there is like lot of climates and weather the patterns that are related to such kind of circulations and uh, st typically studying such systems uh, involves a lot of uh, uh, understanding of such chaotic behavior okay so we'll later on we'll look at what is known as this lorentz model and uh, <clears throat> this lorentz model was initially developed to understand atmospheric uh, convection and uh, you would see that you'd see that it soon depicts a system which is chaotic and uh, actually it was uh, uh, edward lorentz who actually uh, first found out the phenomena of chaos uh, i mean in uh, in terms of <clears throat> finding the solution using one of the first computers and then um, characterizing such chaotic systems okay so as you can see here you have lot of degrees of freedom and uh, it uh, sir soon very chaotic yes please sir I Sir, I can't see anything on the screen. Oh, okay. Maybe I should not make it full screen. I guess. Can you see it now? Yes, sir. For the last five minutes, we could not see anything on the screen. Oh, okay. So maybe I'll just I won't no, make sir, it. No, sir. I can able to see in last five minutes too. Yeah, I think maybe it's some some issue. I guess. So now can everyone see? Actually, I just want to like confirm that. Anyway, it's recorded. I guess I don't know how the recording will come out, but at least now can everyone see it? Yes, sir. Okay. Hello, Hello sir. Uh, yes, please. Uh, sir, I had a doubt regarding the previous slide. If uh, oh yes, please. Yes. Right now. yes, please. Uh, so, so you can tell me if this will be explained in the further lectures. Uh, no, but oh yes. <clears throat> I mean, if you have any particular question, please go uh, ahead. Okay. So we uh, will try to look at it also later. But yeah, please go ahead. Uh, sir, how do we know that it will never come under correlation? after some specific time like what if we run the simulation for long enough time and it comes under correlation yeah i mean that's because a very good these are cyclic systems no like uh, these system, if if there is no dissipation then there is some time period surely then uh, if it is any way going to come into the initial state in the phase space then it will the co the correlation in time uh, over some infinite time step uh it will also oscillate in the same time period if it's uh, I mean, 
Yeah, I understand your question. Uh, so maybe I'll just slightly uh, rephrase it. So basically, there are two typical time scales, right? One is the time scale given for the black uh, pendulum, so which is governed by some root of L over G, <clears throat> and another time scale which is governed for the uh, red pendulum, which is again some root of L over G, depending on the length scales and also the fixed and the also the uh, uh, the point of hinge and so on. You have to do, calculate different time scales for different uh, pendulum. From what I can see, uh, um, the red one is uh, has a, a shorter time period because it's it's like uh, jumping on faster than the black one so you have two typical time scales and now it's a very valid question as to if there's no dissipation meaning if this particular experiment is being carried out in vacuum would uh, how can we make sure that two pendulums will never start repeating the same set of motion right so this is a very important question not, not exactly like that but uh, yeah that that uh, i don't know if it's a one one to one one on two relation but uh, more Specifically, I want to ask, like, how do we know that uh, the correlation, like uh, the actual quantitative correlation between yeah. the motion yeah. of any two pendulums, will not be cyclic? Not the yeah. motion itself, but yeah. the relative correlation between two motions. Yeah. So this is a very important question, and uh, we will see uh, later on. Uh, we'll study. Uh, there are like quite a few uh, theorems that have to to do uh, prove before I can answer that question. First is that uh, you have a unique set of solutions starting from any set of point, right? So you have a, if you take a trajectory in the phase space, uh, <clears throat> starting given that you have this particular starting point, you have a unique trajectory. Now the question is, uh, if you have two uh, initial two points in phase space and they have two different unique set of trajectories, now the question is, will they ever cross each other, right? So we will go ahead and see that uh, such kind of phenomena cannot happen. OK, the only way they can uh, uh, use can start getting some kind of correlation is when they start uh, merging into the same trajectory. Even if there is no dissipation, even if there's no dissipation, if there's dissipation, then it's a different story, right? They all fall into the same fixed point in the in the phase space. No, if there is dissipation, then of course they will uh, return yeah, to exactly. some Q not slash zero. Yeah, uh, exactly. but, uh, if there is no dissipation, then I mean, like they have, uh, irrespective of uh, root over L1 by G and root over L2 by G, they have some uh, time period which we cannot find out due to lack of some analytic method. But there is some time period uh, that we can uh, prove uh, that we uh, that we can prove in Hamilton Jacobi formalism. So, uh, like time, if there is some time period, uh, and if it's not a dissipative system, then how can we say? That the correlation. So the, the thing system. is that uh, you have time periods for the system, but it's not necessary that the system uh, has only these particular time scales. You it will develop other time scales, right? So if you have a system, let's say, uh, I mean, let me take a very simplistic example, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if let's say you have a particular system and you're forcing it at some particular frequency, okay? Just uh, uh, um, um, if you want to think of uh, a simple example that you can uh, that you can do just you can take a thread and then a thread with a uh, with some kind of object at the end and then you can just oscillate it at some particular frequency okay so mm -hmm. if as you start uh, increasing the amplitude of this frequency you soon see that uh, the uh, the particle no longer responds at your forcing frequency but it will start developing other frequencies okay and harmonicity yeah so uh, sorry what did you say uh, like it's sort of an harmonicity, so okay. Uh. Yeah, so in a sense, uh, you can uh, start developing not just the fundamental frequencies of your system, but also higher harmonics, or uh, it can develop new frequencies uh, just from, let's say, uh, how it's uh, how it's defined and uh, how it interacts with the surroundings. Uh, okay, I get it. So it's a system so specific. Not, yeah, it's system specific, and it's not just the fundamental frequency that you will observe in the signal. Uh -huh. So if you if you observe this particular trajectory in the phase space, you would not see a nice circle actually. Mm -hmm. It will be a, a, a all kinds of chaotic motion, but you'll still uh, at some point of time, if you do a, a power spectra of this particular time series, mm -hmm. you would still see some peaks at those uh, fundamental frequencies. It's just that you start to see other frequencies also, and it's no longer a system where uh, you can just track uh, just by looking at two frequencies. Mm -hmm. 
okay so non linearity of the transfer function is the key yeah exactly so the non linearity either from the, uh, the underlying dynamics or from how it's related to the surroundings uh -huh. will definitely alter the system okay got it okay, okay. So you can also get it from how you force the system, how it's dissipating, and there are many other effects. But uh, this particular the, uh, phenomena comes directly from uh, some kind of nonlinearity that is underneath the system. Okay. Understood, sir. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, then so let me just continue. So it's good that you people are already uh, thinking about uh, how to understand such systems. So I was talking about this uh, financial market and then I was talking about this uh, uh, oceanic circulation. So here we again uh, have another system. So it's a biological system. So you have all kinds of some kind of bacteria. I think uh, they have color coded it uh, using some kind of chemicals and they're studying the uh, swarming nature of these bacteria, bacterial colony. And uh, if you track the trajectory of a, sing of a, of a single bacteria, you will again find a very chaotic uh, signal actually. So this is because again, this particular bacteria is not by just by itself, but it's interacting with all its surrounding neighbors, right? And uh, it, it uh, even though it, it can explore the whole domain, it tries to like stay in this particular uh, set of uh, uh, groups actually right so uh, i don't know exactly what is the exact experiment that they're doing but uh, if you look at uh, the uh, so any kind of set of uh, bacterial colonies or any if you say, if you do uh, some uh, uh, biological if you take some biological setup where the individual members are interacting you would soon see that the trajectory of each and every individual is not something that is very well defined. I mean, in the defined sense, it follows the whole group, but you all, it also has this individual fluctuations. So on the whole, uh, you would see a signal which is again uh, chaotic in nature. Okay. So on the whole, you will be able to describe the system, but the individual fluctuations would uh, lead to uh, some kind of a probabilistic uh, nature of the uh, uh, trajectory. Right? It, it might require a probabilistic description at the end. So studying such biological systems where you have a lot of individual uh, bacteria, let's say, and they are interacting, uh, one has to, uh, to understand the dynamics of each and every bacteria, one has to involve concepts from uh, dynamical systems. And if you want to model trajectories, uh, you would want to, you would want to understand how uh, these uh, different trajectories, how these different objects are interacting and what is the uh, uh, exact nature of the chaotic behavior that you see. Okay, so this is for uh, bacterial motion. And here on the right, uh, bottom right, you see uh, what is known as this, uh, the magnetic field of uh, sun. So the magnetic field of the sun, um, it's, uh, it uh, shows uh, some uh, regions which are known as uh, sunspots, right? And they have a certain behavior, meaning that they are periodic over a few set of years, right? And uh, this actually is known as the butterfly diagram. And uh, what happens is that even though the system has a nice periodic behavior, the exact nature of this, if you go into the details of this particular uh, sun uh, spots, actually where the magnetic field has, uh, I think it's slightly higher than the average or slightly lower than the average. I'm not, I, I forgot what exactly is the situation, but you can go read about it. So you would see that the exact, if you take any particular point in the system and you try to track it, you will still get some chaotic nature of the system. Okay. But on an average, you can try to guess or guess some kind of uh, a mean behavior in the system that you can track. Okay. So here again, the bottom, you see some signal, which is, uh, which tells about average uh, sunspot area as a function of time. So this is in years, number of years, you again see some signal, which is on an average, you, you, you see some kind of a fundal, fundamental frequency on thing of the system. But if you go into the details, you see it's still chaotic, right? So for people who are trying to stack, track uh, the solar dynamo, the solar magnetic fields, and they want to understand the magnetic field of the sun, um, um, they would want to know how are these fluctuations uh, which are 
occurring over the time scale of few months or like less than a month how are these fluctuations evolving and what governs these fluctuations right so for those kind of people they would like to want to understand it from a dynamic assistance perspective meaning they want to understand how uh, how do you get a system which is which has a certain order at some particular time scale but also is chaotic at uh, different time scales okay so uh, this is the so here again there's some uh, image from nasa uh, the magnetosphere uh, of the sun right so again you see this magnetic field lines have uh, i mean it's all over the place right it's not a, a nice uh, dipolar magnetic field so you have all kinds of complicated uh, lines that come out and uh, yeah like tracking individual uh, 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 magnetic field lines becomes uh, quite complicated okay so this is with respect to ast like applications in astrophysics let's say and finally i come to an example in uh, superconductors so this uh, above image talks uh, tells about the uh, trajectory of uh, electrons in a two dimensional uh, superconductor and uh, again you have a motion um, so i'm not exactly sure uh, how exactly they are tracking it but i just found this image online i just found it nice and uh, beautiful so uh, they again talk about some very chaotic nature of uh, the general trajectories of uh, of the electrons lines are not changing no no i'm just changing yeah, yeah i'm just still on the same slide i'm like i'm talking about it for quite some time now the top right one i'm talking about can you see can you see my cursor actually the black uh, oh, okay 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 I, i i thought that you had moved to the next oh, okay yeah, yeah no problem no problem so this again uh, so maybe i'll just repeat again so this was the sun right so this is just the sun solar magnetic field the solar magnetic field data this is the bacterial colony and this is just some trajectories of electrons in a two dimensional semiconductor uh, no, uh, not semiconductor superconductor i think so uh, it again talks about some chaotic nature of this trajectories and how uh, and how it affects or uh, how it contributes to the uh, superconductivity of that particular material right so you have different fields of physics uh, not just physics right so physics uh, biology and uh, geophysics and uh, economics uh, and what not so to which uses concepts from dynamical systems to understand uh, how uh, these different systems uh, i mean these are very complex systems and it uses uh, they all use some version of dynamical systems to understand them okay so that helps us to model them and understand them okay so there's one more thing which i wanted to add but i i didn't have any more space is also what is known as this uh, neural network right so one of the first models of neural uh, network uh, so it's the biological neural network hodgkin's and huxley model so uh, which they got the nobel prize actually so there again you have a dynamical description of uh, the behavior of neurons in the uh, of a simple neuron of a single neuron right so uh, you end up start studying such a simple description of a single neuron but when you start coupling with other new set of neurons you to you soon start to see a very chaotic behavior so again you to again see some uh, implications in neuroscience and other fields okay so let me just go to the next slide so here um, it's uh, also about because such systems have been observed uh, in nature so there has been some uh, nice uh, artistic images of uh, such chaotic systems uh, that have been already uh, done quite some time back so can somebody tell me what is the image on the left sorry night by van gogh van yeah. gogh yeah very good very good so again so this is uh, i think uh, van gogh was somewhere in france or something and he was like looking at some i think he was not feeling well or some he was in a darker uh, point of time in life and then he decided to sketch something and you see that it's a uh, he is like trying to understand some very uh, some kind of uh, description somewhere and this like you you see this very complex pattern of things right so such kind of patterns you would expect uh, to arise from very uh, uh, from dynamical systems that are very very complicated right and on the right you have another uh, painting so can again somebody tell me about this one so already you see that the, the scripture is in the vertical direction so you can guess that is from japan
Okay, so this is the okay. Maybe uh, people are not yet familiar with this. So this is the Great Wave, uh, which is a, a nice uh, a photo. Uh, sorry, nice uh, painting of uh, a rogue wave, right? So this is what. So in Japan, people uh, are very much involved in uh, in, uh, in traveling by sea, and uh, Hosukai, he's the painter. He's the artist. So he. Uh, just described a very strong wave that once he observed in the ocean, uh, which kind of is very dangerous for the boats that are traveling. Okay, and you can also see the Mount Fuji at the background. So this again is like a very, uh, very chaotic or very uh, complex system, right? So the evolution of these waves. And to understand them again, one has to uh, use uh, some ideas from dynamical systems. Let's say if you just want to understand how uh, such kind of uh, waves arise out of nowhere okay so uh, so as you can see there's some um, some artistic uh, description of such systems also and uh, if you want to understand the history of uh, of uh, why people started getting interested in into chaos and uh, dynamical systems so we can go all the way back to lorenz so i think this was in i forgot i, I forgot to write down the Timing actually, so maybe just just give me a second. Um, so I'm also googling along the way. Yeah, nineteen sixty-three. So this was the time when they started getting the first computer. So uh, Lorenz, uh, he <coughs> derived a simple set of equations. So he, uh, these equations are just given here. So with three variables, x, y, and z, you'll understand what are x, y, and z later on. Okay. So it's not a very big, uh, a difficult system to understand. So it looks quite simple, right? So he had a system of equations, uh, dx by dt, dy by dt, dz by dt. Is and, it somehow uh, related to population dynamics? I mean, a system with a prey and a predator. I mean, uh, you can also think of systems with prey and predator. I mean, I didn't bother putting them here. So econographic sociology, uh, they also use uh, the ideas from dynamical systems. But uh, this is not exactly the same system, actually. Okay, so this uh, this model talks about how uh, the uh, uh, convection in the atmosphere, how it evolves. So if you are interested in uh, population dynamics, we will look at some problems from population dynamics also, the predator prey model. And uh, there again, uh, you would have some concepts from chaos uh, that comes in. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. okay. So let me just continue on this uh, Lorentz model. So you have these three uh, variables, x, y, and t, which are evolving in time. <laughs> and then the question is, uh, can we try to uh, evolve, can we try to see the trajectory in time, right? So you want to find the solution. So you have happy derived them. You are happy that you have a model to understand the system, but you also want to evolve it in time and see how it, uh, what is the solution, how does the solution look like, right? And this leads to uh, what is known as the Lorentz attractor. So for some parameters, for R, S, and B, so these are some uh, physical parameters uh, that one, ha one can actually, it's a property of the system. So it's a physical parameter that one has already measured. So uh, Lorentz one day, he just uh, went ahead and uh, on this simple computer. So those times they had uh, this uh, computer which had this long sheet of paper with calculations that come out, right? So he had to like officially go inside the computer and then like tap in the exact par parameters and then this huge room of uh, just with a single computer uh, calculating the uh, this evolution of this equation, right? So uh, these people, so Lorenz, for example, he was putting down the solution for this equation. And uh, what he observed is that uh, after some time, it, uh, he got a solution and later he uh, he uh, gave in some other, uh, from some other point, he started the, sol the solution, but with only to certain precision, right? Because he could not enter the exact, uh, <coughs> exact number until the end, because he can't enter infinite precision into a computer. He just gave some particular number into the system and he found that, uh, the result that he got was totally drastically different from what he initially got from a different simulation, right? So that uh, led him to under to try to understand what is the, uh, this phenomenon of chaos, uh, what is the phenomenon of this uh, 
so there's some some kind of randomness that comes out of the system right and uh, if you look at it in the face space so here on the right hand side is a face space you see that um, so this uh, these lines are just a trajectory of of a particular uh, uh, evolution of this uh, system of equations so you see that the trajectory uh, it seems to have a nice pattern right so you have this nice two lobes and officially one would think that uh, this is a very nice system you can just write down the solution analytically or you can just track the solution and there's no issue but actually what happens is that even if it's slightly uh, if let's say there's another trajectory which starts uh, slightly just be behind it you see that it will more or less follow the same uh, same kind of uh, uh, this two lobe structure but uh, the difference between these two trajectories will soon become so large that uh, uh, they would be uncorrelated after some time okay so this uh, structure is known as this lorentz attractor right so even in a chaotic system you do see some kind of structure which is uh, which is well uh, which is well defined actually so you can uh, try to understand the um, the uh, the outer the uh, the geometry of the outer the extreme points of the of the lorentz attractor so this you, you one can do it as i was saying using some mathematical tech well defined mathematical techniques so applied mathematicians also for example are very much interested in studying such systems and uh, you, they can actually go ahead and try to uh, map out the outer outer the um outer the shape of this particular attractor and these are systems which are which have chaos in a determinist, deterministic fashion right when i say deterministic fashion it means that uh, if you, if you write down the initial condition up to infinite precision if you define the system with infinite precision uh, there's just one single trajectory for the system right so there's no uh, there's no question of confusion coming out at any point of time so if you restart the system with exactly the same initial condition and same boundary condition same uh, everything like if if you have like every information to infinite precision if you start exactly at the same point you can repeat the same set of uh, experiment without any issue so here is just numerics but if you do an experiment also like the double pendulum if you start at the same position uh, with infinite precision you would exactly find the same uh, response right but the sensitivity comes from the uh, uh, the fact that we are, do not have complete uh, information or we cannot actually use uh, complete, uh, you cannot actually get complete information out of the system or we cannot measure complete information out of the system. Okay, so that comes from the sensitivity of the initial conditions. So this is opposed to inherent randomness or inherent uh, quantumness of the system. So if you have a quantum mechanical system, you have a probabilistic description because uh, due to the uncertain uncertainty principle you cannot exactly uh, uh, let's say if you are the, if you have some kind of a, an, a, a quantum particle moving a, uh, or let's say even electron in an atomic cloud or something uh, you know that uh, on an average it should be somewhere in some particular uh, domain of this of your experiment but you cannot exactly pinpoint its particular uh, position right and anytime you try to measure it, it's not necessary that it has to give the same value. Okay. So this is a, a fundamental property of those systems. Whereas here, uh, you are looking at, uh, at, at classical systems and you have a deterministic fashion, meaning you can exactly evolve a system and get exact the same solution. But you have uh, a chaotic nature that appears uh, due to the uh, um, due to the way you restart the system right or due to the way you restart your experiment okay so there's a another branch of physics uh, which is known uh, which studies uh, uh, chaos uh, quantum chaos actually which talks about how uh, quantum mechanical system uh, if you take it to the classical limit how, how what is the uh, uh, chaos that up, how does the chaos up, uh, start from a quantum mechanical system and if you take the classical limit how does it evolve actually right so at quantum mechanical level you do not have this sensitivity to initial conditions but at somehow when you take the semi classical limit you do start to get uh, some sensitivity to initial condition so there's a whole branch of uh, some at least uh, some branch of uh, physicists who actually go ahead and they try to understand this uh, quantum chaos systems 
Okay, and uh, so in, with respect to this Edwards Lorentz model, so Lorentz model was one of Lorentz was one of the first uh, geophysicists who was studying uh, geophysical systems, uh, studying convection and atmosphere and so on. But later on, it became a whole uh, branch of physics, which is now uh, geophysical uh, systems. And this year, for example, two uh, Nobel prizes went to. Uh, Sorry, two people uh, got half a Nobel Prize to, for studying uh, geophysical uh, systems, studying climate dynamics, and so on. Okay, so uh, climate science is basically studying evolving uh, such kind of complicated equations uh, on a computer and trying to understand how the climate evolves. What are its, uh, what are the dependencies of uh, the climate on many different parameters? Okay, and the other half of the Nobel Prize went to. Uh, Somebody who was studying spin glass systems, statistical mechanics, uh, Giorgio Parisi. Yes. So, uh, so yeah, that is also in complex systems. But uh, since I'm talking about atmospheric uh, convection, I just thought I'll just put these two people here. Okay. So, are there any questions before I move on to the next slide? <laughs> okay. So I'll just move on to the next slide. So what are the syllabus for this particular course? So I'm done with the basic introduction to the course, right? So just to give a flavor of uh, what are the systems that we'll try to understand. So uh, actually, in the yes? last slide, we we're talking about something correlation. So uh, what do you mean by correlations uh, in this picture? Um, so when I say correlation, it means that let's say you, you take two different times signals, right? And uh, you can actually mathematically define it also. Let's say you have one times, you have a, a, a series, which let's say you call it y1 of t, uh, time series, uh, it's a function of time. And let's say you have another time series, which is y2 of t. And correlation is basically telling you uh, how these two signals are, how, like what is the relation between these two signals, okay? So if you can also, you can think of uh, correl uh, correlation in terms of uh, the same time. So you start both the, time series at let's say t equal to zero and what you can do is like you can average uh, y1 of t times y2 of t over some time let's say capital t and see whether it's a uh, it's a constant or does it tend to a constant value or does it go to zero so if it goes to zero you see that it's not correlated at all meaning y1 fluctuates arbitrarily y2 fluctuates arbitrarily and on an average you do not have any kind of correlation right and similarly you can also look at uh, out of time correlations, meaning um, uh, uh, at, with a particular time lag, let's say y1 of t times y2 of t plus tau, uh, and then uh, you can check whether these two have some kind of correlation. And again, if you do not find any kind of correlation, it means that these two systems are not correlated at all. Okay, is that clear? I said, uh, I, I, I understood, sir, I understood. Okay, okay, good, good. Any other questions? So not from me, not from my side, thank you. Okay, so if anyone has any question, please let me know, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, the syllabus for the close. Um, so we will start with something very simple. Uh, we look at uh, simple uh, dynamical systems, okay. And uh, the initial part of the course would be quite simple for you. Uh, just that there'll be some mathematical aspects, uh, topological consequences, index theory, point bentics and theorems. So these are some of the theorems that we have to go through as, uh, as somebody was asking, like, how do you make sure that uh, these two do not coincide with each other later? So there's some mathematical theorems that are very important in the study, and we'll have to go through them. These are not very difficult per se, so you can just prove it yourself. But uh, just that as physicist, one is not very used to uh, theorems, and uh, unless you do a very high energy physics, like string theory or something, you're not very much into uh, such kind of mathematical equations. But uh, you would see that this uh, initial part is like not so difficult, right? So you can actually, you can actually follow the uh, calculations. It's not very difficult. Just simple equations. Okay. And the second part. Uh, so this is the first part. This flows on different uh, phase space. I mean, these are just trajectories and different dimensions of the phase space. Okay. So that is what we'll be looking at initially. Then we look into the concept of bifurcations. Okay, so bifurcations again is something which tells you about a sudden change in the behavior of your system. So all kinds of this chaotic system, uh, this chaotic nature of the system comes from uh, a system which is actually, if you look at many different systems, 
So if, if you reduce the energy of the system, so even for this particular system, right? So instead of starting at this particular point, if you actually uh, towards the end, if you see, when you see, uh, if you start the system when with energy which is very very low, meaning not uh, at such a high angle but very low angle, you'd see that these all these systems would actually exactly follow each other. Okay, so there'll be like perfect correlation. There won't be any kind of chaotic nature in the system. Okay, so above a particular angle, you you see the sudden change in behavior, where a system which was exactly uh, tractable in the sense that it was not sensitive to initial condition suddenly became sensitive to initial condition right just out of nowhere okay so that uh, to understand that one has to look at the concept of bifurcations okay so this experiment you can actually do it yourself so as i was saying uh, you can actually uh, um, uh, you can actually try to oscillate uh, a thread uh, with uh, um, yeah, with a, with a object side at the end, so you can actually do this experiment yourself. So not the double pendulum, but a single pendulum with another degree of freedom is something that uh, will lead to a chaotic system, right? So or you can think of some other experiment at your home, which you can try yourself. I'm sure this is not very difficult to to make, but the double pendulum, for example, is uh, is slightly more uh, complicated. So you have to like put a hinge, and then you have to like leave uh, uh, these two to oscillate freely, but uh, <clears throat> you can always find some examples online of people who have carried out this particular experiment. And if you actually control, if you control the amount of energy in the system, the initial energy, or the, if you want to think of it in terms of initial displacement, if you keep it small, you would not see the sensitivity to initial condition, but as you increase it, you would see the sudden change in behavior. Okay, so those are captured. So understand them, one has to look at the concept of bifurcations, right? So bifurcation tells about how a system suddenly changes its behavior from one particular solution to another solution, or one behavior to another behavior. Okay, <clears throat> so this is also related to uh, bifurcations are also related to phase transitions in a sense, like first order and second order phase transitions can also be uh, thought of as some kind of bifurcations in the system, but at many many higher dimensions. Okay, so next is about chaos and fractals. So third part of the course. So we'll look at uh, various kind of chaotic systems. For example, we start with Lorentz equations, very simple uh, set of equations, and then uh, we'll look at uh, some mathematical uh, systems which also exhibit uh, this chaotic nature. So in all these chaotic systems, you see some kind of uh, nice pattern actually which comes out, right? You have this nice pattern that comes out. So these are what are known as fractals, right? So these fractals have uh, some uh, uh, dimension which describes in which uh, 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 dimension it actually lives, right? So this is some uh, object or this uh, particular uh, trajectory does not live in a three-dimensional space, but actually lives uh, in uh, something close to a two-dimensional space. It's not even a two-dimensional space. It's not even a plane, right? So because it goes out of plane. So you can define a dimension for these objects and you'd see that it's not an integer dimension. And this kind of characterizes the kind of fractal that you observe, characterize the chaotic system that you observe, right? And we'll do some simple uh, uh, examples to understand chaotic systems, okay? And finally, if I have time, okay, this, so this is a very big question because last time I thought I just stopped here. I could not, but this time I want, I do want to like see if I can, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just go slightly faster on the initial part. So if you, if you find me going very fast, so do stop me so we can stop, so that you can stop here. But well, it, uh, towards the end, I'll talk about some advanced topics. So, for example, machine learning is something which is, uh, which in a sense, like because people were using dynamical systems to study biological uh, neur neurons. So, machine learning, for example, is a system where you use uh, similar kind of models to study artificial neurons. Right. So, it's an artificial neural uh, network. So uh, there are a lot of links between dynamical systems and uh, machine learning. So uh, maybe if I get some time, I will explore this uh, particular topic. And as I was telling you about quantum chaos, it's another uh, field of research that people work on. And then spatiotemporal chaos. If you have systems which have uh, uh, not just uh, uh, not just uh, a time temporal dependence, but also a spatial dependence, right? So you have some space and time involved. So then you get what is known as not just a chaotic system, as in chaos just in time, but chaos in terms of space and time. Okay. 
so that is called a spatial temporal chaos and maybe i'll spend some time if you, if i do get some time maybe i'll choose one of these topics or if i do get a lot of time i can spend more time on this and turbulence is a, like a, a personal uh, working area i think so if somebody's interested they can always ask me to teach it but i won't teach turbulence in this class i think maybe i'll just restrict myself to the top 3 so if you are interested in some particular aspects you can always ask me and we can spend some time and uh, we can look at some particular uh, um, topics in more detail so machine learning for example one of my students uh, actually you are senior actually one year senior so they actually went on he actually went on at something uh, uh, some uh, nice work on machine learning uh, of uh, physics uh, physical systems so physics informed uh, machine learning and uh, he uh, used some uh, concepts from dynamical systems also so if if uh, if uh, i get some time i can actually also ask him to give a lecture on uh, on how this dynamical systems and machine learning sir, are. Uh, uh, yes sir we won't be dealing we won't be dealing with uh, cellular automatons sir, because as far as you know like a huge amount of work uh, has been done by uh, stephen wolfram in this particular topic in fact he went as far as to write a huge book on this topic right yeah exactly exactly so, yeah exactly we won't go into the full details of this particular uh, topic i'll just briefly mention so just to as uh, as an ending note or something i can just talk about uh, a few uh, pointers in possible research directions right so this advanced topic is just to tell us tell expose you to more than just what has been covered in the class right and tell you where exactly uh, research directions are going so not on cellular at automata but uh, in terms of other directions of physics uh, where you have uh, Uh, current research that has been carried out okay for example yes, sir, yes, sir. yeah statistical physics also right like there are like statistical physics approach also to study such systems so one can ask the question uh, can one understand uh, machine learning using statistical physics right so that's a very uh, important uh, the such area where people are trying to understand it using some kind of ensemble description uh, trying to understand it using uh, uh, some co or using concepts from statistical mechanics into those systems right uh, so these are the active areas of research and uh, i myself are not i'm not working on all these different areas but i i can maybe just give you some basic idea of or at least introduce you to some terms the worst case scenario i'll introduce you to these terms the best case scenario i can give you slightly more knowledge than just the name of these terms right so that is what we'll be trying to do at towards the end of the class okay so this is the basic syllabus so does anyone have any questions okay so if there are no more questions let me just go forward um actually i did want to finish it before one hour but okay anyway it's slightly beyond one hour so hopefully uh i shouldn't be too late uh so what are the prerequisites okay there are some people from other departments who wanted to take it so i'm just this is like a message for them i guess so but for for first this, this should be quite easy actually so prerequisites linear algebra is like definitely must uh, some kind of perturbation theory is also needed so perturbation theory i'm sure you would have been exposed in quantum mechanics so some perturbation theory would be used later on in this course um so yeah that is necessary classical mechanics definitely and some basic programming also so um this time i am thinking of giving slightly more computer based assignments um i mean if you can do the experiment at home it's even better but uh, given the constraints that we particularly have uh, maybe i'll ask you to just simulate certain systems on a computer and uh, some basic programming so independent of whichever language you use uh, matlab python uh, um julia or whatever like you can just decide whatever your software you want to use or whatever language you want to use you can just use it and then uh, code it and then check whether the, you are getting some solution using that so this part i won't be teaching at all so this is something that you are supposed to know linear algebra again you are supposed to know perturbation theory supposed to know classical mechanics same so i would not go into the details of the, any of these particular topics but you are supposed to know them as a prerequisite for this course okay and now the question of uh, assignments and quizzes i mean again as i said i have to do uh, some kind of grading i guess so 
what I've decided is that, and also you should also learn something out of the out of this uh, out of this uh, whole exercise. So homework assignments, I'm thinking of giving five in total. So similar to statistical mechanics, right? So maybe uh, people from StatMec course, uh, can you please let me know if that is if that was doable, dealable? Was it too many, too low? It was too many, sir. It was too many. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. It is too many. Yes, Okay, so if, if if I give four assignments, would it be fine? Yes, sir. Okay, so let me just change it here. Sir. Okay, so four assignments in total. So maybe I can make them slightly longer so that I can give, I still want to give 40 marks for assignments. So uh, or maybe I can just keep it, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe yeah, 10 marks for each assignment, four assignments in total, so it'll be 40 marks. Okay, that is good. And quizzes, uh, we can again, I mean, I don't know, last time, I think when I taught this course, when I taught uh, statistical mechanics, uh, people wanted extra quizzes. So I do not know what is the what is situation now. Uh, right, right now, I have planned for two to three exams. Okay. Um, and or project work, right? So project work depends whether you want to do a project or not. So that is totally up to you. So I leave it to you. Um, I did propose the same in statistical mechanics course, but I think nobody took up the project work, even though initially some people were showed some interest. So it depends on how much load you have. Um, so if you have exams, uh, you can take, depending on whether you want to do a project, you can either take two exams um, or three exams. Okay. So, but in total, <clears throat> in total, I need uh, some 60 marks to cover to fin to make this into 100. So I'll have to like take marks from three particular. Uh, exams or two exams and one project work okay <clears throat> okay so is that yes okay so this is uh, what we will do for this class uh, this course actually so four uh, assignments in total and uh, two three quizzes uh, all project work and we will evaluate it out of 100 marks okay then. <clears throat> So with that, uh, maybe I'll just stop this class today. Uh, so do, does anyone have any questions? So just to remind again, we have a class tomorrow from 10 to 11 a.m. And every week we'll have classes from on Wednesdays and Thursdays at these timings. OK, so if there are no more questions, maybe I can leave now. Um, so let me just stop sharing my screen. Where is this Microsoft Teams? Yes. So I'll just stop sharing my screen. Where's my screen uh, sharing thing? Oh yes, please go ahead. What book you said? Can... Yeah, I actually mentioned uh, you can follow uh, uh, Stogatz's book, Steven Stogatz. Um, there are a few other books that I'll mention uh, to, in the next class. If okay, you want sure. to follow more than, more than a single book, I'll just follow one book actually. The, I have the book by Lakshmanan. I mean, is it okay to follow the book by Lakshmanan? Uh, Lakshmanan, uh, he's a nice. Uh, okay, so maybe uh, I don't know whether I should say it on uh, uh, record or something, but he's a very uh, uh, very good researcher. But I think his book is slightly on uh, the more complicated side, right? Um, so his teaching also, I have attended one or two of his, a few of his lectures. But he's a, he's a very good researcher, but his teaching, I find it, I found it slightly more complicated on the complicated side. So it's, it depends upon you actually. So if you find that book interesting and if you can follow it, then well and good. OK, sir. OK, sir. OK. Uh, yeah, in terms of Indian people who wrote books on uh, uh, dynamical systems, I think I would suggest Lakshmanan. I do not know. I think uh, JKB, so uh, uh, J.K. Bhattacharya also maybe has a book on dynamical systems. I'm not sure actually. Let me just Google and find out. Yeah, maybe he ha yeah he does have a book on nonlinear dynamics. I think so. Nonlinear dynamics near and far from equilibrium. So I do not know how good this book is. Um, and this also looks very expensive on Amazon, so I do not know whether I should buy it. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about that book actually, so I can't. Uh, I can't. I can neither. I can't suggest. I can ask around actually if people have that book, but I have never read that book. 
So these are two people uh, I know who work on dynamical systems in India. So J.K. Bhattacharya and uh, Lakshmanan. Uh, so very, very hardcore on just uh, studying systems on just studying dynamical systems, right? Uh, studying systems uh, in order and chaos fashion. So you can, if you want to study uh, their books, you can only always welcome to buy buy them, or you can just download it from Libgen. Okay. So, uh, do you people have any more questions? I, I will give uh, more references uh, next next. Uh, so tomorrow's in tomorrow's class, I've written them down somewhere. I'll give you more references. I also have the books. It's just that I'm very bad with names, so I keep forgetting them. So I'll just go and uh, like write it down on a sheet of paper, and then I'll let, I'll give it to you. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes. Sir, in prerequisites, you mentioned about perturbation theory. So, sir, in in and exactly which part will we require perturbation theory, like in this course? Uh, okay. So, have we done a course on quantum mechanics? Uh, sir, like in first year, yes, but not like a specific course. Oh, you are in second year, is it? Okay. Yes. Sir. So, uh, are you? And perturbation theory is not covered on that time. Oh yeah, that is true, right? I don't know whether first year they covered it. So, uh, for example, um, so Adi, do we have your quantum mechanics course this this semester or is it next year? Yes, sir. yes, sir, we have. Oh, okay, so maybe you'll get you'll start covering it on that particular course, and I think uh, I don't think other people have seen perturbation theory elsewhere, right? So, can somebody tell me if they have seen perturbation theory in other courses? Yeah, so I think uh, maybe as we go along that particular course, you would also encounter perturbation theory, so you can learn from both these courses. So I think that is uh, not an issue. Uh, no, sir. Actually, I was asking like in this course only, like uh, where will you exactly use that, like uh, in so order and chaos? Yeah, we'll use what is known as. Uh, uh, we'll try to understand what are known as uh, oscillators, right? Perturbed oscillators and. Uh, we'll try to understand uh, how uh, systems the time period of these uh, systems, how, how do they get modified from the nonlinearity in the system, right? So we'll introduce it. But does, it have, I mean, does it have anything to do with the quantum mechanics? I mean, it's an approach. Uh, so yeah, it's, just, it's a mathematical approach, but I'm just talking about people who are introduced to the concept of perturbation theory, right? Oh, okay, so, sir. It's just a mathematical technique, right? So there's nothing uh, fancy about it. You'll, you'll use, again, use it in many different uh, fields, but I'm just telling you that it will be used in uh, trying to understand how uh, nonlinearity can modify the typical time scale in your system. And, <clears throat> and we will introduce it in a perturbative fashion. Um, yeah, so I'd, again, again, maybe if you maybe I can just give a very simple uh, basic uh, introduction and then I'll just use it uh, in the class. OK, so it's good that you pointed it out, um, but I'll maybe give you some references uh, before that particular class where you can just go session up your knowledge and then you can you can come and attend the class on uh, where I use perturbation theory. Would that be okay. fine? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. OK, then. So are there any more questions? Sir, will you be writing things like that, that like that, like you wrote last, last semester? Uh, so do, do you people want me to write it on iPad or do you people want me to uh, show it on a screen? Sir, what you did last semester was good, sir. OK, so maybe I'll continue like writing on. everything. Yeah, OK, so that that is fine with me. I have no issues, actually. I do like writing uh, stuff, so I will just that my handwriting is not that good. So I hope uh, if, if you people are happy with my handwriting, I'm happy also. Uh, sir, yes, uh, while writing, if you, if you could like uh, uh, like describe a few more steps, then it would be better because later on, while following notes, uh, I found that uh, it was a bit difficult. Like, Oh, I see. I see. OK, OK, OK. So maybe <clears throat> so this time, maybe I'll try to give more steps then in the derivation. Um, so if not, at least I can uh, I'll put in some more the uh, hints at least on how to get to the next step if, if I have some complicated steps. So I'll try to do that or just remind me when you see a very complicated step just to like put something on the notes, right? So that way you can also remind me and I because I personally do not know exactly where to give more uh, emphasis because like after some time you have seen this calculation already. 
and for you it becomes very trivial right so when i teach uh, sometimes i just overlook such difficulties so do uh, stop me and remind me to put more steps okay <clears throat> so are there any more questions no sir okay uh, anyway if you have any queries or issues just email me or something i do not know uh, the ta for this course yet uh, so i'm just waiting for the physics department people to decide upon to make up their mind and uh, allocate tas but apparently until now it's not yet clear i think this semester the, the whole this whole semester even though uh, we are not in a corona wave or something it's still like very uh, screwed up um so i do not know what the administration is doing but uh, we'll just wait for the few more the days before i can confirm you who is the ta for this course and uh, if at all you have any issues you can also take it up with the ta okay uh, okay then so maybe if there are no more questions i will leave uh, uh, as i said you can email me or just write it on teams actually so if you write it on teams also i do check it out and i can reply to you okay then so i'll stop sharing and i'll leave so maybe i'll just stop recording so that uh, yeah it doesn't run forever okay so see you next